Okay, um, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, uh, today's speaker, Professor Johannes Schmidt uh, um, Hebert. <laughs> and, Perfect. Uh, um, he's uh, the chair of uh, statistics uh, in the Department of Finance uh, in the uh, University of uh, 20. <laughs> okay, great. Um, 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 I, the, a little bit introduction. So the, uh, I, I remember that a few years ago, I started thinking about uh, doing research on deep learning. I start asking some people who are like uh, excellent top researchers in the field of who, where I should have started with. And one of them gave me a paper. Um, at that time, it's an archive paper which is posted online, and I started reading it. Um, and very impressed by the innovation in that paper. And that paper has a one single author, which is Johannes. And at that time, I never met him before. Uh, totally impressed by the level of the work. And after that, uh, we. Um, I start to uh, pay more attention on what he's doing and invite him to come here to give a, a workshop talk. And uh, today we are very, very fortunate to have him here who is willing to give a serious talk, talking about uh, his research uh, on this area. Um, so today um, he's going to talk about a new network, which will be the first of five uh, serious talks that he's going to do. Um, probably let's welcome Professor <laughs> Schmidt Hieber. Okay, thank you, Xiaomin, for this very nice uh, introduction. I am very honored that I uh, allowed to, to give a presentation uh, here. And uh, when I came on, uh, I came on Sunday night, and I, I thought, so compared to, to Amsterdam or the Netherlands, it's so much more in the south, it should be warm and so, but then I saw it's, it's actually colder than, than, than the weather. Uh, I came from so, but but now I saw it's uh, starting with tomorrow. It will be getting better and more spring-like, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so, but since it's cold, we still have time to sit inside and to to, to do a bit of math. And so, to, this is the the first of these five lectures, and I really encourage you to also ask questions if something is not clear during my talk. So just just uh, disrupt me and and ask any question. You, you, you are interested in. Um, it says 48 slides, but this is already a part of the, the next lecture, so I, I don't know how far I come today, so um, I think I just have essentially 30 slides for, for today, and so there's plenty of room also for, <laughs> for discussions. Now, um, so I, I, I prepared two slides to, to motivate why should one look at theory and what are possible goals in a theory that that, that can really help to explain the, the deep learning a bit. Um, and so when I started this, it's already a couple of years ago, and then in the first time I didn't really get anything out of it. At that time there was bit this general belief that this is some, something completely new, uh, completely driven by, by trial and error, and th there's no theory anymore possible for these type of of complex of complexity that these these algorithms have, um, and so I never really believed that. I think it's a uh, we have data, we have a method, so we can embed that into the statistical framework, and of course it's a very complex thing. But then, as we do that with other things uh, we are analyzing, we just have to make somehow to model that in a good way, in order that we can somehow get some, some result out of this, but it still can tell us something about the, 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 the full complexity of the algorithm. Um, and so, for instance, one of the, the issues with um, uh, is that um, the, the deep networks are nowadays applied to extremely complex uh, data structures, uh, and the statistical theory is not there yet really to, to do theory for these sort of data structures. But still what we can do at the, at the beginning is we can try to analyze the deep networks for simpler models that we well understood at the moment. And it's clear if the, if the deep learning works for complex data structures, it should also work for, for easier models. Um, because if it doesn't would work for, for simpler models, there should be something, there's something wrong in the, in the deep networks. And then we can try to analyze what is going on and how we could improve it or so. Okay, so therefore it's a sort of sanity check it makes perfect sense just to start with something simpler and to, to analyze it for a simpler statistical model. Um, and here are these, these issues that make it complicated. So the, the uh, underlying 
data structures are difficult um, than these regularization me me methods um, and very complicated network architectures which are really tailored to this to the problem. Um, and moreover, it's a it's a nonlinear method in the if you look into the like map from the parameters to the to the to the functions that you generate, it's uh, it's nonlinear and it's very hard to understand. It's also the it generates very complicated equivalence classes of parameters which generate the same network, and uh, the, the the function classes in the parameters are also non-convex. So many many issues that are all very difficult, and that seems a bit out of reach. Okay, and so but still there are impressive results, and uh, I think. Here many young people, so I also what I want to do is I want to mention open problems and further directions. And I think many interesting things still have to be discovered in this area. It's all just a start somehow. Okay, so yes, just to, to, to show you, you probably have seen that before. This is uh, the, the Google, the net, <coughs> and this is uh, the architecture. And you see it's extremely difficult and very tailored to this specific application. And then you can wonder, can we still do theory about that? And that if you look at it from, from that point of view, it seems unfeasible. But then I think if you simplify it in a good way, you still, you still can do it. Now, so why do you want to do this theory? What, what, are, what could you get out of a theory? Because all the improvements up to that point are mainly done because people just try different things. They have some ideas on, and it's a very engineering approach with the trial and errors, and this is, but this is very successful. But so what could a theory add to, to that? W when could it be helpful? So and I thought a bit about this problem, and here, here are my points, what I think a, a theory really can, 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 can do. The first thing is it can help to under, that we understand how the signal processing in the network uh, works. Okay, so there's always the question that we, we want to know when a deep network outputs say uh, a patient has cancer, then we want to know somehow where does that come from? How, how does the signal processing work? So that's a, an important thing that the theory can do. Um, the second one is, I think it's also very important, is because at the moment there are so many different, uh, so it's thousands of publications on, on the deep learning. And um, it's a very chaotic field. And I think if we, if we understand the main principles, then we also have a a framework where we, in a more coherent way, can present the, the, the uh, deep learning literature because we understand where there's overlap and what are the main things that, that are really matter. And I think then we can really reduce it to, to, the, to the key concepts and that makes it, that simplifies it in, uh, in, in a sense. And that's also a very important um, uh, task for, for a potential theory. Um, another thing is, um, you see, in, in statistics, we, we think, for instance, wavelets are good for everything, okay, for every problem. So you can always ask the question, now, w why are the deep networks somehow be sometimes better than wavelet techniques or other techniques or uh, spline interpolation or so? And if we have a theoretical framework that allows us really also compare the, uh, the different methods in a, in a theoretical sense and that tells us a bit when one method is better than, than the other method. Um, and I will come to that. I, I might spend uh, half a lecture or so, uh, uh, just explaining different results. There are already results in, in this direction. Um, another thing which people often mention is, uh, is there are many hyperparameters that you have to select in these uh, networks, and that's something a, a theory can. Maybe it's not as always. Maybe they don't say, well, you have to pick 10 or 15 or so, but it can give you somehow an idea of how the things, the hyperparameters, scale in the network, and that gives you. A, say, a range of, of parameter values that, that you can then search over or, or, or yeah. So, so get, get a bit of I, an idea in the scaling of the network. So now I will come later to this thing that uh, what I believe is that the depth of the network, for instance, is a sort of a, a big data phenomenon. So if you have more data, you, you should scale your network deeper. Uh, and that, that comes, for instance, out of the theory. So, so you see that if you have these type of results, it gives you a bit of an understanding of, of the, the, these choices of these parameters. Um, another thing is, and everyone is at the moment extremely enthusiastic about the deep learning, but it also has some, or could have potential drawbacks, and the theory is, is a potential way to find uh, 
limitations of uh, when the deep networks don't perform well. Okay, so and that's uh, another thing we want to do is by uh, studying, for instance, approximation properties of the network function classes to see which functions, for instance, it cannot uh, approximate well, and that gives us a bit of an idea when deep networks should not be applied. Okay, so we have then a sort of red flag that we can raise and say maybe for this problem the deep networks are not that good based on the, the theory that we have. Um, and another thing is that's related to the previous thing, if we detect something where deep networks are not performing well, then we can always think about, okay, so what should we do in order to make them um, better? Um, and the final th uh, point is that if you see in the, in the literature, or yeah, many talks now, um, that people, if they don't use networks uh, for, for the whole problem, normally they have a very clever way to split the problem into one where a subproblem where they use traditional methods and one subproblem where they use um, deep networks, for instance. Okay, so in deep uh, in inverse problems, um, people, for instance, they, they 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 use a traditional inversion regularized inversion scheme, and based on the solution of that, they they apply a network to that. So you see a lot of hybrid methods uh, now in. Where, where, yeah, also the, the AlphaGo is somehow a sort of hybrid method where you combine a deep network with the tree search. Um, and so, so as I, it relates to the point before, so the networks are not good for everything. If we understand so somehow, if we have good understanding when they are good and when not, then that gives us also a good way to design methods that w where we can say, well, for this problem or for this subproblem, you should use this method and for that subproblem, you should stand and, and you should combine them in a, in a certain way. Okay, and that is, I think, still still missing, and the theory potentially could could uh, contribute towards that. Okay, so those are the the main goals, and there are some preliminary results that I talk about, but I think we are far from from answering these these questions. And so this is the the outline of my my lecture. So I just want to go briefly through that. So today I'm going to talk a bit of about neural network structures and and the deep learning. Uh, so I will start with the perceptron, mention the cellular networks, go to feed forward networks, discuss a bit of other network structures, and then finally discuss some relevant aspects of the training of deep, deep networks that we will need for the uh, future uh, lectures. And uh, so starting from Friday, uh, we will then talk more about the mathematical results and the first part will be on, on theory for shallow networks. This is mainly the theory which has been developed in the 80s and 90s when there was the first uh, hype around these uh, neural networks. And uh, then uh, next week, uh, I want to devote one full lecture to just to mention about properties that you have if you add additional layers. Why are deep networks better than shallow networks? Um, and the second le lecture is then really about the uh, the, the results, the more recent results about statistical theory for for deep value networks. And the last lecture, yeah, it's not completely done yet, so I think a bit about uh, open problems or some results about the energy landscape, I, I will see. Okay, so today we will we will do this, uh, this part, and we will start with, uh, with the perceptron. So, um, The, the function class that underlies the, the perceptron um, is very simple. It's just uh, uh, essentially it just uh, cuts the, the space and, 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 uh, and by, by a line, and then on one side of the line you assign the value plus one, and on the other side of the line you assign the value minus one. Okay, so the if you think already about the activation function, so this is just uh, uh, one and and minus one. Um, and now you can say, well, this. Uh, if you just think about deep networks, you would say, so this one cannot be be learned because it's a non-smooth activation function. So you cannot compute the gradient with respect to that. So how can you fit the parameters? But there is an algorithm, and therefore it's nice to to mention that this uh, it doesn't need actually to to be smooth um, if you just consider one one. Um, one unit, and this is the, the, the perceptron algorithm 
uh, by, by Rosenblatt in 58. And it says if, if you have data um, x i y i um, and r to the d, and then the y i's, the, the labels are uh, two classes, and they are labeled by minus 1 and 1. And what you want to do is you want to find in your, uh, somehow in your data set, you want to, 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 to put a, a half space of the function class I mentioned on the previous slide. And the question is now, how do you do that? And uh, what Rosenblatt um, suggested to do is the following, is you, you cycle through your data set, okay, so you, you look uh, until you find, so you initialize at some point and then you, you look um, uh, for an example which, uh, where the labels and the predicted labels do not match. And then what you do is you just make an update of the weights and the, the, the shift V by just uh, scaling it in a particular way. And you do that um, until there's no point anymore that is misclassified. And actually you can write that also as a stochastic gradient descent algorithm if you like. If you put a specific loss function, you can see that it's exactly the same, the same thing. Um, and then what you can prove about this is you can prove that um, if there exists a, a, a true hyperplane that, that, um, um, that, that separates the, the two classes, then you can find that after a certain number of steps and there are good bounds for, uh, the, number of, for the number of steps that you need in order to, to, to find this, uh, the, the plane, the separating hyperplane. Um, and of course, if, if there's no such hyperplane, then the, the thing uh, goes on forever. The, um, you have to stop it at some point. Um, okay, so this is somehow the, the most basic thing is just to, to, to fit one of these uh, sigma uh, and then the scalar products um, and the shift. And um, the next, the, the, the most natural extension now is uh, because it's a very limited model just to put one, one, one hyperplane into your classification, um, is to, to look at the linear combination of these, these functions. Okay, so before we were talking about uh, one such function, um, and now we talk about the linear combination of those. Okay, so what we want to do is we want somehow to fit um, a function of uh, this form to our data, and that is then called a, a shallow network. And now you can wonder why don't I write it like a like in the computer science literature with like a network. I I, I prefer this this algebraic notation here because it's um, it, it it's much easier to understand than the the mathematical structure if we write it in this form. And I will come back to this graphical representation of a network later. But it's exactly the same thing. What uh, so. It's, exactly what a shallow network is uh, as a function class. It's just a linear combination of these perceptron functions. Um, and here, one thing that changes now as well is because of the training, um, the, the activation function um, sigma, which you put in here, that is now something different than the minus one, one that has been used for the, for the perceptron. So it can be essentially any, any function here um, and so you should not think about minus one one anymore in this setup. Um, okay, so what are important activation functions? Here's a, 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 a short list. Um, there are a few of them which are used a lot in, in practice and uh, when there was this first uh, hype around the neural networks in the 80s and late 80s and, and 90s, people were mostly interested in sigmoidal activation functions. Those are activation functions, they look like a CDF of a continuous random variable. So they go from minus one on monotone and they go to one. And uh, the most famous example in this class is the logistic act, uh, activation function. And the mo more recent literature is about activation functions, which are the value, which stands for rectified linear unit or variations of that. So the value activation function is the the blue curve here, it's just zero and then, then x um, on this, on this, on the positive half axis. And the variations are, um, that are used in the uh, theory sometimes are leaky value, 
there you just add another slope with a, with a different slope parameter A uh, on the negative half axis so it's not so the support is on the whole real line of this function compared to the to the classical value um, or another thing is the uh, some theory has problems with uh, the the fact that this is not differentiable here at 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 zero and so then for instance people consider theory for the for the softmax activation function which is the the red curve and it's just a, a smooth um, approximation of the of the value function but uh, it seems very similar, but here's already one thing and that comes back next week, I think, in the, uh, in the talk, is a tiny perturbation in the activation function can change the, the, the approximation theoretic properties of the activation function completely. So you should not think, okay, so this looks very much like the blue curve, the red curve, so, so that should be the, the, the same. It's, it's not guaranteed. So uh, you will see that that's an interesting observation from the theory that uh, the, so if you perturb the, the activation function, you can get completely different uh, properties out of it. So, so just looking at these pictures is, is, is you, you can be, I think, misguided a bit. Would yeah. that be possible to apply the first algorithm to train or to find the weight of uh, the shallow? Uh, again? Would that be possible to, uh, to apply the first uh -huh. algorithm mm -hmm. to, yeah. to find yeah, the weight the of the shallow level? I, I don't and achieve the same result. I don't know of any uh, extension of the of I the perceptron to to the shallow networks. I yeah, see. but I will come later to an algorithm, a greedy algorithm that is a bit of this similar type, um, and we will do that next lecture. Actually, yeah. You also have a question. When you say shallow network, for what I understand from the previous slide, you mean a, a single uh, layer of linear bonds, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it, is this a standard term in the literature? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the terminology is uh, one layer is shallow and everything which is more than one layer is deep. But the, the way it's used in practice is that deep is, is really much larger than, than, than one. Uh, um, okay, good questions. Um, yeah, so, okay, suppose we have data. Um, what are now the parameters in the, in the shallow network that we have to fit to the data? Um, well, what we fix is the, what is called the, the network architecture, which comes from this graphical representation. That means we somehow fix an, uh, an M and we fix an activation function sigma. And the parameters that we have to, to adjust to the data um, are these uh, vectors Wj, the, the shifts or biases Vj, and uh, the lin uh, these uh, CJs over over here. Okay, so um, that means, I'm, and, and I will come to that next week. Uh, how how to do that is um, uh, when I discuss the the, the shallow networks. Um, exactly. So. Uh, so, so what are the problems with this already with the shallow networks? Uh, even in that case, the function class that it generates is non-convex. So you can easily see that, for instance, suppose I take here the value, net, uh, the value activation function and say in, uh, the input dimension is 1, so d is equal to 1, then you get, uh, right, every of these values gives you essentially one, one kink. And so this, the function space that you generate here is uh, the function space of... Um, is the function space of piecewise, um, piecewise linear functions with um, m kinks. And if you now take uh, um, two of these functions and you, you take uh, the average, then you get a function which has two m kinks and that is not in the space anymore of functions with m kinks. So, so you see that's not a, for the value, for instance, it's not a convex space and it holds in, in general for, for almost all activation functions. Except, for instance, if you take here the identity uh, sigma of x equals to x, then it's a, a convex space, but it's not an interesting thing. Um, a second uh, important thing is if we think, uh, think about theory, then we can actually also see that as a sort of a dictionary learning problem, a specific dictionary learning problem. What does that mean? Well, what we do a lot in, in non-parametric statistics is that we try to 
to expand something in a basis or function system. Okay, so and suppose the suppose the the WJs and the VJs uh, they are fixed, and we just want to learn the uh, CJs. In this case, this is then just a, a classical uh, function exp expansion and with respect to this function system generated by those functions. And now what we have in addition to that, we have the, the parameters wj and vj, and those are functions, so that means we can also um, learn a bit the, the, the functions that we want to use in order to represent the signal. Okay, and that is something which comes back also if we later talk about the deep networks. Somehow the the idea that, 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 that you get then is that the first layers in the network they just build essentially a good function system in which you can represent your, your data and the last thing is then a sort of linear classifier. Okay, so in contrast to the, the classical thing, if we expand with respect to wavelets, we have to, uh, we have to fix the, the, the function system, but here somehow you can learn a bit a, a, a good function system that you can use in order to, to, to represent your data. Okay, so um, and that, that that will come back in the in, in the lecture on on Friday. Okay, so now let me come to the to the deep uh, networks, and that has to be written that that needs a bit more uh, notation, and I also want to write it in the algebraic form because I and then we can understand uh, and can analyze these these networks. So uh, what I need for that is I, I first need a bit of notation. So if we have two vectors uh, of the same dimension r, what we do is then we define the, the shifted activation function is, so what does that mean is we take the vector y, we subtract the vector v, so component y, so that gives us a vector of y1 v1 to yr minus vr, and then to each of these components we apply the activation function sigma. Okay, so it's just notation, this is just what sigma v of uh, y means actually. Um, and the second thing is that we have to, to fix. That's the generalization of the, the M of from the previous slide. We have to fix to, to numbers which I call the network architecture because that's wh what the, the architecture is in the, in the uh, graphical representation. And the first thing is just an, a positive integer which is called the number of hidden layers or the depth of the network. And if we have fixed a capital L as a depth, then we can choose a, a width vector which has length ML plus two, so it goes from P0 to PL plus one, and it will show us somehow the, the, the width of the, net, of the network. Okay, so what is now a network in this algebraic formulation is we take a, a, the input vector X <coughs> and then we multiply it with the, with the matrix W0, say, and that's the matrix vector multiplication, so that gives us a vector. Um, and then we apply this operation here. So we, we, we shift it by, say, uh, V1. And then we apply, that still gives a vector, right? And then we apply component-wise to this vector the activation function sigma. And then we just iterate uh, this procedure. So we, um, we, we alternate between matrix vector multiplication and then the the, the component-wise application of the, the activation function. We do that in L, L times. Um, that's where the L comes from. And at the end, we apply another activation function, uh, which I call the output activation function that is adjusted to the, to the underlying um, uh, problem that we are, that we are con uh, considering. Okay, and so where's the P? The P is just the... Uh, the, the dimensions of these matrices. So uh, P0 is actually the same as the input dimension, say D, and otherwise these, these, these matrices, um, they have dimension, uh, those are matrices uh, Pi times Pi plus one, and the, the, the Pi's are ones which we, which we fix in advance. <coughs> okay, so this is just uh, the, the, the algebraic way to write a, a, a feed-forward neural network. Um, so here's some uh, remarks about that. First of all, why it's called feed-forward? Uh, because it's somehow that just the, the information, you see that the way 
it's rich and the information goes from the input to the output and it's uh, somehow processed through the, through, the, uh, through the network if you write it as a network. Um, and yeah, so another important thing is what, what one should notice is really the parameters in the network and what we later want to estimate from the data are all these entries of the matrices W0 to WL and also of the, the entries of the shift vectors. Those are the, the, the say, free parameters that we want to learn from the, from the data. Um, and here's now the, the, the thing you see, the, the, the way the, the, the people would write it in the computer science literature. They would write it as a, as a, as a network, uh, as a graph, where you put the input in the, uh, in the first layer, and then you have these uh, nodes of the network which are arranged in, in layers. And each of these nodes uh, stands for an operation, namely it takes the, the, the signal, the incoming signal in this node, it multiplies that with, an, with another vector uh, and shifts that by, by a number and then applies the activation function. Okay. Um, and that's exactly the same thing, the, 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 the same functions, you generate exactly the same functions that, that I have been writing in the, with, with this formula. And now you can see the, where all these, uh, the, the, the terminology comes from, namely the, the L, the capital L in the, in the architecture is the number of hidden layers. So in this case, uh, capital L would be, would be 2. And the vector p, the width vector, is, the, is the, the, the number of units in each of these layers, starting with the first. Um, is uh, Here you have, we have four units, then we have three, three, and two. Okay, so that would, that would generate the, the width vector. Um, it's just another way to, to represent the same, the same uh, function classes. And that's important to, right? As statisticians also, we are really interested in what type of functions can you generate with, with, these, with these networks. And then it's more natural to, to work with the with explicit uh, formula for, for the functions. Um, now, let me finally come to the output activation function. So there's one, uh, there's this row which comes really at the end. Um, and then it's, it really matters what, what type of, of problem you're looking at. So if, what, what I did, for instance, uh, um, if you study um, regression, then the, you, you take just rho as the identity. And th that means that what, what we did also for the shallow networks before is you just build the linear classifier in at, the, at, at the end, OK? Or at just the linear combination at the end. Um, but if you, if you consider, for instance, classification, then you want that these functions, the, the functions itself should be a probability vector, right? And so you have what comes here, somehow this thing which, which you have built here, you have to map that into a probability vector. And then what you do is you, you put another uh, out, uh, non-trivial non -trivial output uh, activation function. And in this case, you would then take uh, normally the, the, the softmax function, which maps the the whole thing into a into a probability vector. Okay. Um, okay, and then there are special types of, of neural networks. First of all, uh, a lot of theory will be derived for for sparse networks. And what is a sparse network? A sparse network is a is a network where the the matrices are assumed to be sparse itself. Okay, so that means uh, many of these entries are supposed to be non-zero. We don't maybe don't know where the, the non-zero entries are, but they're just somehow sparse. And we say that the ith layer is, is fully connected if the, the wi's are, are dense matrices, which means they're, uh, yeah, typically all of the entries are, are non-zero. Uh, so if you, if you like a small exercise, what you can check is that if you stick in here l equals one, you get exactly the same functions back that we have been writing before as a, as a shallow network. So in this case, you have an easier formula. Um, and yeah, you just write out what, what, what all these things are. You just have to do that until, until here. And then you see you can exactly get this dictionary type uh, representation. You can, you can get that back. Where I, in the shallow network case, I only consider the case where rho is the identity. 
Uh, and now we come to the question you, you were asking before. So, okay, deep networks really refers to the case where, where L is, is strictly larger than one, but you should think about maybe uh, 10 or 100 or so. Here's the, the thing with the, with the depth. Um, that's a, a, a graph that I, a plot that I took from another article by coming here. And um, so you see that for these machine learning conferences, the, uh, the number of, of layers, and so, so the time axis goes unfortunately from right to left. So in 2010, 2011, the people would still use shallow networks or the, the best networks were shallow networks. Then it was moving to eight, uh, then to around 20. And then suddenly it was going up to 152. That has to do with the specific resonance structure, which I will explain in a moment. But you see that uh, I think that the important thing is that the, the networks get deeper. And that has something to do also with the uh, uh, computational side. That is easier to do the computation. Um, but maybe it also, yeah, that's what I want to stress. Maybe it has also to do, for instance, with more data being more data being available and other things. And at the same time, you see this, uh, that the, the, the classification arrow goes down, and the networks at the same time uh, become become deeper. So if we want to do that, if we want to do a theory, we really have to we really have to look into uh, networks which are deep, and that means L. Should, should not be one or two or so. We sh and, and that makes it difficult because if you go back to that, if you want to study this, it's um, these sigmas, they, they induce nonlinearity, non right? And if you pile up a lot of sigmas or compose them with each other, you make it more and more nonlinear, which means somehow the map that maps the parameter to the output uh, becomes more and more nonlinear. That, that, that makes it more tricky to, to, to deal with deeper networks. Okay, another thing is... Is yeah. number activation in each layer important? Um, so, okay, that's a, uh, I think that, that might uh, depend on the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the specific applications. But uh, what we later find in the theory is that it doesn't really matter if you make it large enough. Um, somehow the network architecture is not so important um, from the theoretical point of view. Um, and it just matters that you put enough regularization in the in the training. That's the, that's the important bit. And so that's also what people observe in practice that you get a saturation phenomenon. So they try different ar uh, architectures. If the network is too uh, thin, then you get larger misclassification. And then at some point you get good misclassification. And then if you make it larger, it doesn't improve anymore. Somehow that these type of results, I think, are uh, are good descriptions of what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing, if we want to do that as a st like for instance, statistical modeling, then we really have to, to think about this problem as a high dimensional problem where we have more, more parameters, right? The parameters are these entries of the matrices and the shift vectors, more parameters than, than the sample size. So here's an example, which is this famous uh, AlexNet. And it uses 60 million parameters. Um, and uh, the sample size that you have is 1.2 million. So, so, so smaller. So we are really in this high dimensional statistical regime where also called over parameterization. Yes? So is this 1.2 million number taking into consideration the data augmentation tricks like translation, rotation of images which you do and that can be random and infinitely many, many. Yeah. So your 1.2 million, million can become really, really large. If, if so is this representing that? I think that was the, the, the raw data set without any data augmentation in that case. Yeah. yeah because yeah. augmentation makes this yeah, larger yeah. Than it makes it yeah, but from a statistical point, it just doesn't add any information, right? It, it gives but you highly yeah. correlated uh, data somehow. True. Yeah, but yeah. it's fill, filling up the space of the dimensions. Right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but I would still say somehow from a statistical modeling perspective, the high dimensional perspective is still right, although you could enlarge your your, your data set by data augmentation tricks. Yeah, because that's yeah. what was used to train this model. Yeah, I, I see that there's a lot of gain for these specific applications if you do data augmentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and now I just want to come to some other network structures. And uh, I must say that all of those, they, they have not really explored that much in the theory. So there's a lot of things to do, and I just want to mention them here. 
because those are really the ones that are the, 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 the successful ones in, in applications. So the first one, uh, these residual networks, are, we have seen that already, the, the one which, um, with the 152 layers. Um, to introduce that, so something which we also can do, we can write these, these networks, we, we can write it in this form that I have been showing you before, in the machine learning parlance that would be the, the unfolded representation, but we can also write it as a, as a recurrent uh, map where we just um, uh, iterate this, this function L times. And then we have to modify, of course, the, the output layer and so on. Okay? And if we write it in this, in this uh, recurrent formulation, then that allows us to, to, to get many different uh, modifications that, that might also be of interest. And the, the residual network is one specific um, such uh, modification. And so what does it do? Um, so it's a bit of a funny thing is you take, um, uh, you, you map somehow the identity forward, okay? So if, if for the even um, case, what you do is you, you also push the xk minus one to the xk plus one directly, okay? So what's the, what's the gain of then? The gain is then that you don't, somehow you can, if, if wk is equal to zero, what do you get here? So say you take here the value uh, activation function, and that is uh, non-negative, so say it's on scale on zero one, then you just map xk minus one to xk plus one, okay? And that means somehow without, then this is absolutely sparse, right? It's just everywhere zero, all entries are zero. It means you don't have to consume any parameters in order to get the identity map. If you want to go from here, if you want to model the identity map, you always have to put non-zero parameters, so that consumes uh, parameters to have the identity. And here, if you write it in this residual formulation, the identity, you get that for free if you think about a number of uh, like non-zero parameters, and that, that comes also in the theory back later, the number of non-zero parameters are the ones which make somehow your statistical risk uh, large. Um, and Whereas for the classical, the, the ones I showed you before, this feed-forward neural networks, you have a saturation phenomenon that if you make them too, too deep, then at some point the, the generalization becomes worse. Uh, that has been observed, but for the, for the residual networks, you can go as deep as you like. Okay, so the, the idea is a bit that suppose you, you have an object which is not very complex, so you can maybe build it with 10 layers, and then with the feed forward, you still have to, 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 to pass it through all these other layers and you have to adjust the, the parameters in the right way. With the residual networks, if you're done and then you just get essentially the identity afterwards and you're still do good in the output. Um, and so what people have been doing here, and I don't discuss this in the lecture, I cannot do everything and I'm not an expert for that, but you can link that, you can somehow define here a, a continuous limit and then you can link that to dynamical systems and you can study that in terms of stability and so on. And you see this, in this field, you can come from very many di different directions and you can, you can do theory and I will really focus on the, on the statistical theory here. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the most prominent uh, network structures are these convolutional neural networks. Um, and they are useful if, if the, um, the data have, uh, have some underlying stationarity property. Okay, so that means they, and if you do image classification and you have the cat or the dog, then it shouldn't matter whether the cat is in the right upper corner or the left lower corner. So you should always get the same output. And then you can wonder how do, how do I need to, or what does that imply on the, the structure of these matrices W, okay? Such that I get the, the invariance under, if I put, for instance, all entries one up and the last one, okay, the, the boundary case, what, whatever, but somehow all these entries in the in the vector x, which contains the pixel values, somehow are shifted by one, but I still want to get exactly the same function um, out, uh, maybe up to boundary problems. So, so what does that imply? And that implies essentially that you should take a circulant or, or triplets matrices. So those are matrices which where all the the entries on the on the main and off diagonal entry, uh, they're they're all on, on these diagonals. They always have the same the same entry. Okay, so that, that in, uh, induces exactly this, this property of, of these functions. 
Okay, so um, and, and there are more modifications. There, there are additional steps in these convolutional neural networks that I don't want to, to explain here. But so, so, so you see, if you have more structure in your data, that means also typically you, you, you put structure into these into the in the in the feed forward network and that reduces the, the number of parameters considerably because now you don't have the, the number of parameters it's not any more uh, linear or it's not any more the, the number of entries here it's more the 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 number of, of, of nodes because it's somehow that determines the size of, of the of the matrix of the this matrix. Um, another important thing are these uh, recurrent neural networks and those are ones which are designed for if you have sequential data um, and uh, or what we all have in our smartphones are the, the, the specific like long short uh, term memory networks, LSTM networks that are somehow the, the, the network generalization of the, of the hidden Markov uh, models. And I also have, there's no theory yet for, for, for those uh, networks. Okay, so finally, um, let me come a, uh, and talk a bit about some important aspects of the network training. Um, and so I, d I don't want to talk about these regularization techniques. They play uh, a minor role in the, in the theory at this moment. I, I just want to mention two things which are somehow important for the, the, the way we model, we model the problem. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so the gradient descent, I'm, I'm sure you have, you have seen that before, I just want to mention it here, is, okay, so your, your data are x, i, y, i, say, and um, now we have a class of candidate functions, for instance, networks index in a parameter uh, theta, say a parameter vector theta in some in vector space, um, and then um, we have a, a, a loss function, um, for each of these uh, individual outcomes, and then we combine that into a, a, a general like overall loss, where we just sum over all these um, individual losses, and that's the thing we we want to want to minimize, right? That's we want to find a, a, a network or a parameter theta that, that that minimizes this this loss, and one way to do that is to, uh, to use a gradient descent. And for gradient descent, what you do is you sample an initial parameter theta naught. And then you just do an updating step uh, where you compute uh, the gradient and you have this factor here which is called the, 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 the learning rate that says somehow how fast you want to go with your gradient. And because it's a non-convex problem that will not converge uh, so there's many local minima um, and also some other uh, critical uh, points, stationary points and uh, yeah, so that will end up in one of these local minima, um, and uh, that's that's one of the issues with the with the neural networks. Um, but the gradient descent is not computationally not feasible. So uh, an easier way to do it would be to do the stochastic gradient descent, which more corresponds to to the the Perceptron algorithm that I have been talking about. And in this case, you just you either cycle through your data or you you, you s randomly sample indices, say at uh, step i, you take index ti by some rule, and then you just take one data point and you for 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 the gradient uh, for in the in the updating step and that in the updating step and that of course is much much uh, computationally much faster, but it's also more unstable because you get uh, a lot of variability by just taking just one observation in your, in your gradient. So the compromise is then to do this mini batch approach where you where you balance uh, the, the gradient descent with the stochastic gradient descent and you go over smaller so-called mini batches to compute uh, the gradient uh, and that induces of course another hyperparameter in the, in the, in the network uh, learning. Um, now what are, the, what are the loss functions that are used in, in the deep learning literature and um, in general this is always the loss function that is, that is induced by the by the log likelihood function. Okay, so if we have, would have a statistical model, we would have a log likelihood, and that would somehow induce a, a loss function. And the machine learners, they call that the, the cross entropy loss. Uh, and there's always a bit confusion about that, what the cross entropy loss is, because um, most people just think it's the, 
the, the one for classification, but that's not right. So if you change the problem, then you also have to change the, 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 the loss. Uh, and if you have regression, the, the loss function, the cross entropy loss is, say, regression with Gaussian errors. The cross entropy loss is, is this one where you just have the, the, the usual least squares fit. And that's the one you want to minimize with the, with the gradient de or stochastic gradient descent. Um, and in the other case, which is mostly um, considered in the deep learning, therefore people think about this as the, uh, the, the standard cases. If you do the classification with, say, k classes, um, then your setup is as follows. Um, you really want to, uh, you want to, to estimate a, a probability vector for, for, for each class. So this is a bit different than the classification that is often considered in the statistical literature, where we're just, we just want to estimate what the, whether we are in the right class or, or not. But here we really want to, in, in, in this setup, uh, in the deep learning, we really want to, for every class, we want to, to have a probability, an estimated probability, how likely it is that the, the object is in that class, whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. Um, and so what is the, the loss function then in this case? So the, the log likelihood, if you write it out, it's, it's given by this, by this formula. So you have these vectors y, i, um, and then the, 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 the log here that you have to, to adjust. Um, okay, so those are the, the classical loss functions. And then uh, for some recent applications, uh, maybe you have heard about the style transfer. So you want, for instance, a picture, a, a, a photograph, you want to look at like a, a Van Gogh painting or so. If you do this type of things, then people also know that you have to, that that comes by, by, by designing a suitable loss function. Uh, so uh, and and so, so the, it's more general now than than just taking the the cross entropy. Um, another important thing I, I want to talk about is the the network initialization because that really determines the success and that plays a big role for the existing statistical theory. Um, so if you initialize at a bad point, um, then the yeah it's you can easily or just try it. I mean, you, you will see it's, it's the, the deep learning performs extremely poorly. Um, and so the idea is, what people say always, is that the way the, the initialization nowadays works, it's already close to the truth. It's already close to, 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 to the true parameters. And I will come to that in a, in a second. But it's in general, it's also the, it's all these initialization schemes that we have at the moment are really based on heuristics. It's not well, not well understood. Um, and you can also, for instance, if you, even if you take a good initialization scheme and you make the learning rate in the first step too large, you will come, come to a completely different uh, uh, attraction domain and it will probably uh, be very bad, the, the, what you get out. Okay, so that's important. You, you initialize and you're not allowed to walk too far away from your initialization, otherwise you will uh, somehow end up with a, with, a bad, with a bad solution. Therefore, the initialization is extremely important. And that's a bit uh, the underlying idea here. And I explain again with this algebraic formulation. So what uh, Gloro and, and, and Benjiro uh, suggested to do is to draw the, the entries of the weight matrices and the entries of no, the, the shift. So the shifts are all set to zero in the initialization. And the entries of the weight matrices, they are uh, independently sampled from a uniform uh, with, um, uh, with, with, this, with this parameter. Why that parameter? Because um, it, makes the, it makes the variance of, of these entries as a random variable, if you, what is the variance of that, right? It's just uh, uh, one over six or so, um, one over 12, one over six, whatever. Um, somehow it makes the variance of the, the each individual entry um, exactly uh, uh, one. Um, and, and what does that mean? So we draw, essentially independent entries which all have variance one and that means if the say if the 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 the, the, the matrices are quadratic um, if those are square matrices uh, in this case the the matrices are essentially of we, we draw them from orthogonal matrices okay so that's the thing um, and that comes essentially from this idea if we would have no activation function which means no activation function means activation function is is the identity, then the network 
this can be written in just you take an x and you, you just make an l plus one uh, matrix uh, vector multiplications. Okay, so or you 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 multiply l plus one matrices and then apply x. And in this case, if you draw them from from orthogonal trans uh, orthogonal matrices, then what you do here is essentially a, a, a random walk on the on the sphere. Okay, so you you have your sphere and the, you have your sphere, and then you you um, somehow you you just make if you now okay so say this is um, w zero and this is w one w zero and and so you walk on on uh, on this thing and then you walk maybe back and so on okay um, and now here you can see essentially one reason why the depth is um, or is, is relevant because now suppose the true function that you want to learn, the true function itself, is an orthogonal transformation times x. So it lives also on this. It also lives on somewhere on this on this uh, uh, space of orthogonal matrices. Then what you can do is, you can, or all what you need to do is, you, you start with an initializer, and then you have afterwards you have to adjust these matrices in order that they match the, the true orthogonal matrix, right? But if you would just have one matrix, so if you would have uh, L equals uh, zero here, just one matrix, you would have to change the, uh, you would have to change from here to here. So you would have to make a big change in the matrix. If you have L, if you compose L plus one such matrices, you can make each of them the angle uh, change essentially by something of the order one over L. Okay, so everything gets a bit shifted towards this this point such that you match this. The, the, the function and and that means somehow the the amount you need to change the the, the individual parameters gets gets then smaller if you make l if you make the capital l larger okay so that's exactly this phenomenon that what people observed that, that the initialization is always close to the truth what, what can it mean in terms of this function of course the, the function itself is is far away from the truth how can you know what the true function is so you just have to randomly pick a function but in terms of the parameters, it's true if you if you uh, uh, if you have a, a, a large depth. Um, but now there's a, a thing, um, and that is um, if you have an activation function, this will lead to to shrinkage actually if the, this wall. So suppose you take the the value activation function, you have you pick that from an orthogonal transformation, uh, then essentially half. If it's a random orthogonal transformation, half of these entries they will be uh, negative, and half of them will be uh, positive. And the the value activation function just kills all the negative entries. Okay, so that means the half of the entries essentially are set to zero. And then in this case, you um, you you observe that that uh, is the norm of the the, the original uh, squared norm of of the x divided by two roughly. Okay, so and if you add more layers. You make the signal smaller and smaller, so that means somehow you you have a, an initial vector which has maybe an L2 norm one, and then you you go through the network, and then somehow you shrink the signal to zero. That is not good. That's not what you want. So so what you have to do is you have to to adjust for the shrinkage phenomenon here by multiplying with a, a factor which depends on the on the activation function. In this case, you see you would have to multiply the Z, W zero by square root two. In order to get uh, to get rid of that uh, a half here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm also almost done. Yeah. No. Yeah. That, that's that was the remark. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Um, so I just want to mention this. There, there's one more and uh, last two minutes. Um, uh, one more initialization scheme, which is also motivating a bit the statistical theory that I have been working on. And that is sparse initialization. Um, and so what is proposed is essentially to, to, to sample that, not these matrices from sparse matrices, but essentially the, uh, in each layer, the incoming signal is only allowed to come from a fixed number of, of sources. So, and that, that reduces somehow the, 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 the amount of connections in, in the network. So that also exists. And then there are many other variations. So if you just want to see them, the major ones, and l just look up this the the, the Claire's um, web page web page on that. So 
as Zhao Ming mentioned, I'm al already out of time. Thank you for your attention. The next lecture will be on Friday. It will discuss then the statistical theory. It will be a bit more mathematical than what we did today. And if you have comments, suggestions, if you didn't understand any something, just come by. I'm sitting in room 347. I'm always happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Lecture intends to be a lecture, not a, a seminar talk. And the class that uh, uh, Johannes will be here for the next ten days. So if you have any, we're not going to take question now. If you have any question, probably contact him directly afterwards.